Great, so this is another IBASA and EPI webinar day. Uh, welcome everyone that's signing in to the IBASA and EPI webinar on what ESD managers are looking for when they appoint service providers. And I must say we've had quite a good response in terms of the signups. It looks like the room is filling up too. Uh, so welcome to this webinar. Just to remind you that we're using a platform through which you can participate in different ways. So, by the way, my name is Christoph Oosthuizen, and I've got some other people in the room here today, too. Um, I'm from the Entrepreneurial Planning Institute, and we're working closely with IBASA in delivering these uh, webinars to the benefit of practitioners like business advisors, mentors, and coaches that want to improve their ability to serve their clients. And also, it counts, of course, towards the CPD points that you need for maintaining your status as a IBASA member if you are a member and if you're not a member wait till the end we'll show you how you can easily become a member um, so on the on the use of the platform uh, quickly click onto the chat bubble there and you'll be able to participate in uh, talking to us here in the room and as well as the other attendees and I see uh, Musa has already uh, said welcome to everyone Musa is also a Vasa board member uh, hi Musa um, also, Anita, Carol, uh, Clive, uh, Donald, uh, uh, Gibbon, Gloria, Jabu, uh, Yuan, and also some, some members of the uh, IBASA board there. Nikita, hi, nice seeing your name here. Um, uh, Teko, uh, uh, and of course, Terence, who is, uh, I think, our most vivid attendee of the webinars. So if you can. Um, on the on the chat there, if you open the chat, just say hi by saying where you're from, uh, what place in, in, in the world you're from, and as well as what your speciality in supporting entrepreneurs and small businesses is. Uh, we found in the past that people have connected to each other when they look for uh, assistance in programs that they run. So it's also a way for you to present yourself in this community. So um, just type into the chat where you're from and what your speciality in business advising or small business support is. And then we can start to see how the community is showing up here too. Um, there is another button which is Q&A. So we'll ask you during the webinar to please uh, note that uh, the questions you want to post, you need to use the Q&A button for. And you can post a question there that will make sure that we notice it and address it in the webinar. So those are the kind of rules um, that we have. Um, I'm very happy to say that we've got two very uh, uh, experienced people in the ESD field as panelists here today and I'm going to ask that uh, Lita and uh, Anya that you please switch on your cameras and unmute yourselves so that we can get you into the room too um, and um, uh, Carl if you can give us a, a gallery view there that we can see everyone uh, so uh, by the way Carl Fenter is also from the EPI is in the back of the room uh, making sure that everything runs smoothly in terms of delivering uh, this webinar to you as the attendees. Um, and we also have uh, Lisejo Mokwena from the IBASA office that will be sharing some news uh, around IBASA towards the end of the webinar. Um, and it's also an opportunity for you as members of IBASA to engage um, on that front. So by the way, I see there's a lot of uh, activity in the chat there. You can please, please while the webinar continues, uh, participate in the chat and share your views and so on there too. Uh, but let me quickly introduce to you Lita and Anya. Um, uh, Lita is, I know Lita, I think for about 10 or so years by now, Lita. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As first as Lita Kuta is, is the ESD director at Tiger Brands currently, but he's got experience in quite a few fields, including in government and starting off working in government procurement offices here in Cape Town where uh, we first met. Um, and then moving on to incentives and grants with the DTI, uh, 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 Lita, uh, good experience there in understanding what the needs of the businesses are. But then working with Woolworths in, in creating a strategy uh, for ESD, early times for ESD then still, and later at uh, Econ and um, uh, then with Telcom, where I think you spent quite a few years, uh, including creating the Future Makers uh, program. So lots of experience in ESD and most recently now with Tiger Brands spearheading uh, the BE procurement and ESD programs there. So welcome to the, the webinar, Lita. We're looking forward to learn from you what corporates are thinking and uh, how they think about the service providers that they engage with. 
And then we also have in the room Anya, Anya Le Clerc, uh, who is an ESD consultant with Think Room Consulting, um, uh, servicing the needs from that perspective as a service provider to ESD, for ESD buyers. Uh, I see that you've got a master's degree in entrepreneurship, Anya. So, uh, a master of entrepreneurship, uh, we could call you. <laughs> but yeah, starting way back in 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 Sassel, Kim City, before ESD was a thing yet. Huh? Um, of course, now today it is a thing, and uh, you've been involved in that quite a bit, including at Future Makers too with Telcom. Um, at that point in time, I think you were in, with Enterprise Room, um, but currently very busy with things like. Microsoft's um, SME for Africa program. So there's some other perspectives in terms of not only working in South Africa with small businesses that may be relevant for us to note, uh, but looking forward to your contribution to, I already in the setup learned a few, a few things from uh, Anya that I didn't know before. So I'm, I'm hoping that all of you will be uh, in the same position to leave this webinar today with at least one or two big insights that you've gained in terms of what this ESD field is and how we as service providers can better serve the needs of the buyers in, in, in ESD and uh, business development services. So that's enough for introduction and I think we can just jump into the, the topic. But before we do so, I'm going to ask that we participate in a poll quickly. Um, and I'm going to put up a poll on asking how many individuals you've been supporting. It's just to, for us to get an idea of how many individuals you've been supporting that are ESD clients. So we're not asking who are all the clients. You should be able to see the poll there, by, by the way. It should, the, the, the menu should pop up there. And I see some people are already voting. So please vote there. How many individuals, small businesses have, that are ESD clients have you been supporting? So it's not all the clients that you're supporting, uh, just ESD clients. So how much experience do you have in working with individual businesses. So if it's five on a program or 10 on a program, we'll count all of them together. And I see there's quite a bit of voting happening here. Uh, some of us are, are serving over 90 a year. So that's quite a bit of businesses that we are supporting. Uh, one or two that are doing over 70, but most of us are on the lower scale. Um, so I see there's still some voting happening. We're gonna end the poll soon, so uh, please, uh, voting for now, and then we're going to end the poll, and we can show it to everyone. Uh, Ten or less is by far the most. It's about a third of people in the room, and then about a quarter are doing none. So we're still new to this ESD field. And then some of us, 16%, uh, 11 to 20, and the rest uh, bigger numbers. So there are some of us in the room that are quite seems to be quite experienced in ESD, but most of us new or doing a few clients only. Um, at least a quarter of us are, have not done any ESD uh, projects. So panelists, um, that gives us a bit of a context to uh, consider when we start the discussion. Um, so let's not uh, waste time on any other formalities. Um, uh, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Lee Takuta, the uh, East Director at Tiger Brands. And uh, Lita, our main question here today is, uh, what is the perspective of ESD buyers? Um, what are the thoughts? Where are we going? What are the new trends that those that are presenting themselves as potential service providers should take note of? I know you've got a slide, so at the right moment, um, you can ask Carl to put the slide up for us. Yeah. Thank you very much, Crystal, for the opportunities, and I greet everyone. Uh, where, am I, where I'm going to start with the, the conversation is for people to first understand what, why we exist as an office. We, we exist because there is a challenge of a low participation of black entrepreneurs into big supply chains. Right? As a result of that, we get entrusted with big investments to make sure that we can help SMMEs to grow. We also are expected to deliver on the BE points of the companies that we work for. And thirdly, we are also expected to make sure that we contribute into the development of South Africa as a country. So as a result of that, it means that when you do the work that we do, you gotta be able to first be able to embrace the companies that you work for, understand what they want you to deliver as a, as a company. So the, the first thing that we look at is things that are flowing from procurement. And from a procurement perspective, there's a big pressure to make sure that we buy from the right suppliers, 
who provide the right product at the right quality, at the right price, at the right time. So if you look at that, you will already see that um, Black SME participating in that because of the challenge, because they've never had the head start to be able to do that. So we are actually starting from ground zero. Some of the entrepreneurs are really pathfinders in the sector because they will be the first ones who actually enter those different categories. So few things that we've already seen in terms of the, the, the SMEs that, I mean, the, the advisors that we talk to. Firstly, there's a huge level of um, different variety of experience such that it becomes a huge challenge to be able to determine who's good, who's not. So take an example of a chartered accountant. They've got a sector, they all go through the same test. Once they get that qualification, there's a level of reliance on the qualification that they have. And you also, there's a minimum expected standards of performance that you can expect. And unfortunately, you don't get that when it comes to business advisors. You know, and that is more historic because in the past 20 years, people could easily set up a company if they get retrenched or they resign in their companies and they can find a job and the first thing they do, they become a small business practitioner. You know, as a result of that, because there are no standards to enter the sector, someone could just, if they lend a contract, they'll be able to, 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 to deliver on that. That's the, the, the first challenge that we have. The second one is that, also, we're not seeing the, the, the solutions that are coming in, that they're very impactful. You get very much, very standard solutions that you're getting to develop these SMMEs. And as a result, these, these, these um, type of interventions you get mainly around capacity building and mainly around helping them on compliance. But that is not enough because they still need to supply products to market. And we are finding that SMMEs are also, um, the, the practitioners are not so, also not collaborating so that where they are weak, they are able to partner with another partner to make sure that they can strengthen their case, right? And also we find there's a huge challenge around understanding supply chain. Some of the practitioners have never actually worked in the corporate environment. They've never worked in companies that are supplying into corporate environment, right? As a result, they don't understand the pressures that it means to supply a bleak supply chain. Tiger Brand is a company, we are a 29 billion rand buying company. That's a huge number, right? We buy locally, we buy globally. So our local entrepreneurs are actually competing, not just between black and white in South Africa. They are also competing with global companies and some of those companies are big. So if you are being supported by someone who has no appreciation of that level of magnitude, it creates a challenge. All right, because the, the quality then is going to flow through into the manner to which they deliver the products. And as a result, that's where you're going to start seeing failure sort of flowing through. And the third thing is that there is a, a huge challenge around, you know, the parameters of the skill. What skills that does one need to have in order to become a proper, proper, reliable, you know, business advisors? So those are the type of things that you grapple with. As, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ESD head, right? And then when it comes to experience, which I want to cover so that you, I can be able to give you examples, right? Is that um, example one is that at the DTI, when I used to, to, to run their incentives, there was a lot of copy and paste. There were a lot of issues around uh, poor execution, poor putting together of you know, um, business proposals, uh, uninformed financials, unexplainable, you know, financial modelings that were used. As a result, those programs collapsed and some of them DTI had to close. Not because the government in intent was not there, but because the quality was just not flowing through. People were, were churning business plans to get the funding, all right? Once they get the funding, no one knows what happens to those entities. Right. So what that means is that as a, as a, as a business advisor, you got to make sure you, you've got a level of care for the beneficiaries you're helping. So it doesn't end when you submit your last invoice. You've got to be able to have a follow through and have that relationship with that entrepreneur, because that's the very same entrepreneur you should be using as a test case when you go to another client where you can showcase the work that you've done. Right. And then at Woolies, we had issues around when we're supporting farmers. Well, a lot of support 
um, we, we were given to, to farmers, uh, agronomics uh, support, extension support. But when these uh, farmers are failing, the service providers we were using didn't want to own up to it. As a result, we have to write off loans that we, we, we provided the farmers. We were sitting with undersupply of product. You know, and now you've got a buyer who's very pissed because they didn't get the product. You've got you know, a, a, a transformation head who's pissed because we've invested so much money and we have to write off big loans. And as a result, we still need to go back to our principals and ask for money. And that makes it incredibly difficult, right? I know the service provider left um, us and they went to another company and they just as well did the same because I've heard in the market that they also made the same mistakes that they've made at, at, at Woolies. But the problem is because there are no checks and balances and organizations that are managing the performance, who are the good apples, who are the bad apples, and make sure that you weed the bad apples out, you sit with the challenge of the same people going to one company to the next. I mean, we've got 420 listed companies. So you mess up in one, you go to the next one. You mess up, you go to the next one. But the challenge then is that then a reputation gets created. And then that is where the big challenges come. And also interesting then, what actually happens, that is where you start seeing guys like your Deloitte coming in. Because they can see that, look, there's an opportunity in ESD. You find Deloitte, KPMG, um, EY, getting into ESD. Because they are already trusted from an audit, they know no one is going to question their skill set. And now they are taking business, which should be going to business advisors. So they're taking advantage of, an, of, of a situation. And, and, and SMME managers now are playing it safe. So I'd rather use a, a, a Deloitte, a KPMG, or an EY to make sure that at least I know the quality of work will be done. But you pay incredible you know, amounts of money in terms of the charge and so forth. Right. And then at, at Telcom, we, we ran programs, and I worked with Anya, who was, was part of the panel, and she'll understand some of the issues that we had, you know, because they used to help us to manage service providers, the fights they used to have with the quality of work that they, you know, that service providers used to provide at, at Telcom. Fortunately, the, uh, the company she used to work for used to be the oversight, provide oversight over other service providers. And we used to pull our hair with the level of quality you know, some of the people who are listening here will be shocked with the, if I mentioned the companies that were actually doing that, right? And we, we had programs which are well intent, well funded, but are incredibly badly executed. As a result, when you go back and you ask for money, we struggle because we don't have a business case, right? So, 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 so those are type of things that we, we sit with. As a result, I know some of my colleagues in the sector they, 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 they get fired. Some of them experience budget cuts, all right? Some of them don't even have access to procurement because if procurement gives you an opportunity and you make a, a you know, you don't deliver, the supplier is not provided the adequate support, they just close procurement, you know, because they don't trust you again to give you another opportunity. So these are all the damages that are being done by the sector, all right? But the interesting thing is that the sector itself has inclined itself in terms of saying who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, because that's pretty much what needs to happen, so that we are able to, to, to go as corporate, you know, South Africa, go to the good guys and leave the bad guys out. But currently, no one is actually doing that. And that is the role that Ibasa needs to play a far more bigger role. Because once we can put reliance on the skill set, the qualification, the accreditation, it makes life more easy. Right. So in, in how our world has changed, right, um, I'm not quite sure in terms of the experience. Uh, I know there was a question around how many companies people have supported. I'm not sure in terms of the experience. Those who've been in the sector in the, in, in the early 90s, where there was Zika, Kuna, and so forth, will know that most of the ESD managers with either someone from HR who was just given this portfolio because government wants it. You know, the level of skill was so low that it became easy for, for, for dodgy service providers to just sell them a gimmick and they'll buy it. But what has happened over time, right? For example, Anya, there was a joke now, she's just got her master's in entrepreneurship. You know, there are universities that are providing M MCOM in development finance. The, the quality of ESD managers is changing. As a result, 
poor service providers are going to be caught wanting, right? Because CAs also, I know some of our, my colleagues who are CAs, and, and all of a sudden the market is going to shrink because now you are dealing with someone who's very switched on. So you can no longer sell them the, the, old, the old gimmick that I'll come in, do an assessment, and I, I once I've done my assessment to, to training capacity, it's, it's gone beyond that. Why is that? It's because the focus of corporates now is on the core business. It's no longer about supporting companies that are doing HR, cleaning, and so forth, security. At Tiger, for an example, I'm expected to, to help an entrepreneur who wants to set up a factory that does peanut processing because we've got a black hat brand that needs peanuts. So if you understand the supply chain there, one part I need to support farmers who are planting the peanuts and they science into it. Secondly, I need a processor who's gonna process, clean, create, and, and, and also crush the peanuts and supply it at a quality standards. So if I ask you to, how do you support me to set up this processing plant? I can tell you now, there's gonna be a lot of very few people who can do it because the skill sets that are, are required to set up an enterprise that does uh, manufacturing is incredibly different. And if you go to more and more companies, they are not gonna meet their PE targets from a pressure procurement if they don't go into core, right? At, at Telcom, we help companies who are doing fiber optic. So you can imagine that now a service provider who helps there has to have an affinity of understanding telecommunication and understand how it works so that when you support that entrepreneur who does the fiber rollout, we are able not only just to help them to increase their skills, impact their technical uh, you know, support, we are also able to link them to other markets, which, which brings me to the next point to say, the ESD solution integration is becoming incredibly different. So those service providers will come and say, I do training. Someone else comes and says, no, I do coaching. Someone else will come and say, no, I specialize. Those days are gone. Because as ESD managers, I cannot be managing 20 or 30 service providers. I need service providers that are collaborating and giving me one solution. So if you take the example of the peanuts that I've mentioned, there's engineering work that needs to go there. There's someone who comes from the food services, must understand. There's someone who must understand hassle, right? Someone who understands supply chain logistics, inventory management, right? And all those skills cannot exist in one supplier. So it means there needs to be some level of collaboration, all right? Because the solutions that I want, I want to work with one company that will deliver a total solution for me and be able to manage one um, uh, sort of service provider there. Then there's also expectation on return on investment. So companies are no longer throwing money into ESD. You know, uh, at Telcom, I had 150 million rand. I'm trying to get over 100 million here at, at Tiger Brands. They're not just going to sit here, give it to me because the BE code says so. They're going to expect a return, right? That return comes in multiple folds. One, our, our supply chain has to be uh, honored. So if you order 10 apples, I gotta get 10 apples. Those days of coming with excuses are gone. Two, I'm expected to deliver the BE points, which are um, a part of the package. Three, I need to provide, deliver quality service provider. So that black entrepreneur must be able to hold their own and be able to actually demonstrate that we can build black entrepreneurs. And some of them even put, you know, um, Headle rates on some of the money that they give us. So they will say, giving you 100 million when you return it back to me, I want 20% return. There are companies who do that. So when you do that, you gotta make sure you do the right thing. Right. And the last point in terms of how the world has changed is ESD managers are looking for allies, not for service providers. Right. I need someone who's gonna help me to think. So if I'm setting up the company that does the peanuts, I want the service provider not only is going to deliver that project, but also is going to say, you know what, these peanuts, part of diversification, this supplier can also supply peanuts to Yam Yam. They can supply peanuts to Asia. So it's no longer about you just servicing me because your sustainability of an entrepreneur doesn't just depend on one enterprise, right? So you got to be able to be my ally, help me to think, look at my blind spots and so forth, and not necessarily from selling me a service. Because I, 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 you know, we all know that they'll tell you blind spot because they want to charge you. It's not about that. It's about building a relationship. 
so that we are able to work longer. And then once that entrenchment happens, then it becomes easy to, 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 to grow your business as a service provider. Because some of the service providers are micro enterprises themselves, but they expect me to entrust them to build a hundred million black business. It's, it, it doesn't work like that. But fortunately, because you're selling your skill, if I'm happy with your skill, but I also need far more than that, where, where the relationship comes in, help me to think, help the entrepreneur to access other markets over and above just a tiger brand in this, in this example, you know, because that's the level of appreciation because if that happens and the entrepreneur is more successful, I get to, to get, you know, a, a good reputation in the organization. The program gets good reputation. The company gets a good reputation and gets what happens, the company then invests more and then there's more work to be done. All right. In terms of future, where, where, where are we going? Right. So as you approach companies, you're going to be expected to provide 10 key solutions. You're not going to be, be, be you know, allowed to come and say, I do business assessment. After the assessment, then what? You're going to be able to say, I do end-to-end. -end. I will help a, a company that does manufacturing from analyzing the opportunity, cost, whether it's, it's, it's a, the business case makes sense, it's, it's going to be profitable to identifying an, an entrepreneur to help them set up a factory, set up their system processes, and also help them to deliver to the client, right? So that is what is required now. And that can only be done through collaborative work uh, between the, 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 you know, um, the, 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 the business service providers. Secondly, service providers, we expect them to have deep networks, right? So that because our supply chain cuts across borders, right? And also cuts across continents, that service providers who are merely only no South African environment are not going to make it. Because as I said, when I opened, we're dealing a global world. Our local suppliers are competing with global suppliers. So it's incredibly in imperative that you could be part of Ibasa here, but have a network to be part of other, you know, um, IPA partners globally, so that you are able to draw expertise because some of the expertise don't exist in this country, right? Um, so you gotta be able to, to use that deep network because that network is also what makes you to provide a far more better value proposition. The third part is then it's, um, you, we, we need uh, digital powered solutions. So if you're an ESD practitioner and you don't embrace technology, you are actually gonna be left behind. We are already in a webinar now, which is a technology that allows me to talk to people across the country. In fact, across the world, they can connect. And that means that when you have your solution, but they are backed by technology, you are able to scale up, you are able to do far more fairly quickly. And those things are incredibly important in terms of making sure that um, you are able to provide a service that is scalable because one of the key things that we need in the corporate sector is scalability. I'll, I'll do an example. So we are busy now wanting to help wheat suppliers. You know, we are looking for, you know, farmers that can do between 20 and 100,000 tons, right? And we can't be helping farmers bits and pieces, but we're gonna be helping farmers across the country. So some are gonna be in Cape Town, Western Cape, some are gonna be in Northwest and so forth. But when we work with a service provider, they gotta have the technology that, is, that allows them to manage both sides, provide the same service, enable SMMEs and the farmers to do what they need to do, but in a very much coordinated and in a technology manner, we want to be able to use uh, internet of things so that you can predict when it's gonna rain, you know how much water you need to irrigate. So some of the business advisors are not embracing technology. As a result, they actually are really going to struggle to compete, more especially if they are global partners that come here and provide the, the, the similar service in terms of um, the, 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 the support of, of, of SMMEs. So um, I don't want to run too much. I know that I've got about um, 15 minutes. Um, I don't no. know if I should 
<clears throat> uh, so, so uh, uh, this is such a, uh, a rich text uh, slide with so much in it, um, and unfortunately, the, the format of a webinar doesn't allow us to go into depth of all of it. But uh, perhaps um, I, I saw a while ago, Lita, that you actually posted something on the social media saying um, there should be scope for us to address these issues a bit more thoroughly. You know, sort of. So maybe there's a follow-up to this webinar for us to go in each of these points that you're raising in much more depth. You know, sort of because we as a community needs to learn about how the service providers can better meet, meet the needs of the uh, the buyers, um, so that we can be better at having the impact that's required. And we only know, will know that when we know what the needs are. So um, thank you very much for, for, for sharing that. I'm, I'm sure we're going to come back to a point or two in terms of the questions. So by the way, I don't see many questions coming onto the Q&A. So I just want to remind participants that you can post your questions on the Q&A. Or if, if it's a, a statement that you want to make that you would like us to uh, discuss a bit further, you can also put it there. Um, so we'll come back to you, Lita, just now to, to, to address those things that people are responding to. But before we move on, let's, um, let's just hear from you in terms of what you feel as attendees to this webinar, uh, what the most pressing challenges are that we are facing in uh, ESD programs nowadays. So those that of you that are not involved in any ESD programs, you may know of ESD programs that you've noticed. So uh, what are the most pressing issues uh, uh, BDS providers do not understand the needs. BDS providers do not have the capacity to deliver what is needed. The providers are competing with each other. Uh, a few BDS providers are dominating the market. Uh, new entrants uh, um, are good marketers, but they're not so good at implementing, so they take the work without being able to do it. Uh, ESD managers are not clear about what they need. Um, Good quality practitioners are working. By the way, you can select more than one if you if you think more than one is applicable. Good quality practitioners are working as individuals who are not geared for ESD projects. Accreditation to professional bodies is not required. Uh, focus on corporate compliance rather than long-term economic development. And the last one, lack of collaboration between the ecosystem players. So take your pick there, and you can keep uh, voting for a moment there. Uh, what you believe the most challenging issues are that we are facing. Um, we're going to introduce um, Anya now to uh, give us the perspective of people delivering what uh, the corporate buyers of BDS programs, um, yeah, sort of, so from the, other, from the other side of the spectrum, if we can put it that way. Uh, so Anya, um, what is happening out there in the marketplace and how can we as practitioners better position ourselves to deliver on the needs of the ESD managers? Okay, yeah, sure. So that's it. I'm very glad Lita went first. So as you was talking, I'm smiling. I'm smiling. I'm smiling and smiling because we, we speak from such different worlds and, and it's actually a space where you ask me the interesting question. So how big is this world really? So how big is this ESD pool that we are talking about and how many people are in there? So um, for those, I could see Anita, another, another fellow colleague and some interesting participants on the, on the channel right now. So it's good to see the, the active involvement. So I'm Anya, I'm from Think Room Consulting. So Think Room Consulting, we are based in, in Johannesburg, but we're actually very virtual. We, we operate from anywhere in Africa and I'll show you shortly how widely spread we are. So I'm gonna try and give you a, a view of how we as practitioners see it so Lita, maybe we can give you some insights as well. So what we can offer. So Thinkroom, basically we're a bunch of, of analysts and development specialists who've got quite a bit of corporate experience and, and all of us also have small businesses on the side. So it means um, a compulsory element is that if you're in this consulting game, you have to have your own sideline business or would have started one or maybe have gone through the total entrepreneurial phase where you have sold it off or handed it up handed it off to the next entrepreneur who will take over from it. So what we believe is we believe we understand small business because we're entrepreneurs ourselves. We've all been in corporates and we can actually play this middle role now to be able to facilitate the game between the two and the needs we should to have to make sure that the expectations get met. The other element which we really pride ourselves in is that we are always up to date with the latest trends and thinking. So you'll see a lot of research coming from us as well as Wiki news and trends is one of those things we really stay on top of every single day of our life. So on the next 
um, slide, it, it, you'll get a bigger picture of where we have played. So we are trying to reach all of the 54 countries in Africa, but currently these are the ones which we have had a direct impact. And it's, it's quite interesting, so even the French speaking ones. So in total, we've, we've, we've touched about close to 10,000 SMEs in Africa, which we feel that is rather significant if we look at the team and the experience that we've had. So enough about us, and I'm going to share with you our highest levels, our highest key, 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 key learnings that we have undergone in the industry. So I'll start off maybe with the first point, so we can move on two slides. The first point being that um, from a programmatic level, so as Lita would have said, as ESD practitioners, we might come in and the ESD practitioner will say we've seen two scenarios. So the one guy would say, please just get this job done. Go out and do it. Okay. So you are, you are given this ball and this monkey and just make sure I get my points. Okay. The other scenario, like a typical Lita, where he will actually mark you, make, him, make the team part of his extended team. So everywhere he goes, every intervention, informing them of the bigger strategic pictures, etc you actually form part of this ESD team within the big corporate. So that is one of the two approaches we've seen. And as an ESD practitioner, you've got to decide which, which side of the coin do you prefer to play. Secondly, being part of this program, it's always a case of running at the pace of the entrepreneur versus running at the pace of the corporate, because those two paces are really, really, really very different. Because if we look at an ESD program and the typical governance structures, you've got to really leave enough time to be able to gear the project to get going before you actually get going. So the key trick in the ESD and as a practitioner is being able to run at the pace of the entrepreneur whilst managing the corporate. Okay, then when it starts with implementation, you've got the two angles. You've either got the spray and pray approach, so meaning that um, an approach where you say, let's just train everyone, or let's give everyone the same the same corporate pack or a, a CI pack as an example. But we have found with experience that it actually has to go in a direction where you have a bespoke programmatic approach. And with that, we specifically mean it's a scientific approach. So whatever you do, that you have a diagnosis for it. So meaning very specifics that you can do and that each and every entrepreneur, depending on the size, the industry and where they're on their business life cycle, you are able to deliver a program customized to their solutions. So what I'm saying is that it's, it's all about these days about a narrow and a deep approach rather than a wide approach. Okay, so meaning we can't be the be all in all to a, a, a business anymore when we come and develop them. We have to rather tackle and define a very specific key area and make sure we have a high impact with that than trying to do a lot in, in a very short period of time. Um, and with programmatic approach, with that word specific, Specifically, that's kind of the trick in our trade, and I'm not going to give away all our secrets, but it's to be able to make sure that from the beginning and end to end, not only having a turnkey solution, but that you are able to follow a programmatic approach. So based on very specific program and project management principles that you're, be, that you're able to report, engage, flag, um, track key decisions that are made so that the pro project management principles never drop off from it because ultimately you're running a program, okay? Then the management of expectations from day one. And, and these are, this, this sentence specifically speaks about scars of wars and not tattoos because this is often where the disparity between where the service provider has delivered and whether the entrepreneur agrees that the service provider has delivered and whether the ESD manager and the corporate agrees that the ESD part parties have delivered is this alignment of the little word expectations. So whenever there's a scope of work that is developed, it's always good to go into a charter level. So meaning that you can actually elaborate on the key deliverables, outputs, milestones, payment terms, and key KPIs associated with each and every project, because there might be KPIs related to the corporate, to the entrepreneur, to the bigger business strategy, so that all the expectations around all stakeholders can actually be managed. Then dealing at an entrepreneurial level, the, some of the key success factors have been, so now you're a mentor to one of these little suppliers in the supply chain, say the guy from the peanut factory, 
and you, you, you still have to create a trust relationship. And often when reporting or reflecting or developing, these guys are, are kind of intimidated because you're coming in and trying to tell them what to do, but hopefully you don't do that. You, so that building of the trust relationship and, and getting them to tell the mental and the, the de development ESD practitioners really what they need to hear versus what we want to hear. Okay, because there's a very, very big difference. I, I always base it on an example. Um, I had a business that we got into Woolworths, okay, and not knowing that actually the payment terms were 90 days, um, already 90 days overdue, and we had a bank loan of 8 million rand, so the bank loan hadn't been paid for two months. So you can see the ripple effect of that. Yet every time you met with the entrepreneur, he would keep telling you the story, oh, it's going well, and Woolworths has ordered another 200 project, um, products. Yet at the, at the back of where the numbers really matter, it, it was never validated by a real bank statement. So that fine ear of listening to what, they, what you think they want to tell you versus what you really need to hear. So there's always the trick in the trade of being able to ask the right questions and being able to develop that relationship of trust. And then at the end of ESD, so everyone loves a good news story, but when a project has been concluded or expectations have been met or not, there's always this case where you want to, whether it's for a sustainability report or for reporting purposes, that there will be a very specific window of opportunity related to telling stories. I can't have developed a store, an entrepreneur or a peanut factory in, and finish the project in July. And in December, I go back to the entrepreneur and now I want to do a good news story. No. So with any ESD, if there's good news stories to be told, but there's actually a very specific window. And that should ultimately be a story that gets told like from when things are still bad, ugly, and there's nothing to a point where the journey and the journey could be told. So whether it's, it's going from hero to zero, because often if that window, to, of, of, to, window of opportunity has closed, um, we might have seen the success stories going under, but we shouldn't be afraid of these stories because these are again, are again learnings. So in, in, in my world, those were the top six things that came to mind for ESD practitioners. Sorry, just struggling to find the unmute uh, button there. I must just share this with you, with you that uh, uh, I had to keep in my chuckle here when uh, Rita was talking about the black cat uh, example, which is a real example, but um, is, uh, it's not about peanuts. You know, it's about BE, and um, so it's not a fat cat, it's a black cat, <laughs> and we can go on <laughs> in various no, ways. Um, that <laughs> one out. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, maybe, um, uh, Anya, if you can keep your video on, um, because we're going to go into discussion mode just now, and then we can uh, see everyone that's taking part in the discussion. So uh, jokes aside, um, this is serious business and it is great, Lita, to hear the, about the shifts in industry and how uh, corporate South Africa is shifting away from the marginalized BEE uh, handing out of contracts into uh, core business, um, which of course makes them much more astute in terms of what they're looking for in the impact. Um, so would it be fair, Lita, to say that the shift is away from the tick box uh, you know, score your points, and I see Nikita had quite a long uh, comment about that, um, which you already started answering the text Q&A. So, by the way, attendees can also see the text answers in the Q&A. Um, but let's focus on that uh, for a moment. You know, sort of that two percent uh, target that companies had have for after-tax uh, profit uh, as a spend on 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 um, the ESD programs. Uh, how how is the sh that shift affecting the service provision? And in, in what way, you know, when you when you look at the, at the service provider, is are you are you more astute in terms of the impact on core business than too? All right, so um, it's it's quite interesting. So so one of the things that service providers need to realize is that there's a there's a challenge now that your business development support practitioners are actually competing with fund managers. If 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 you if you're following in the sector. So fund managers want to couple the 2% in full and manage the fund so that they can fund the entrepreneurs. So there's a bit of a sort of a, a, um, a contrast there because from a theory then, then they would say that, look, 
90% of the money should go into fund, 10% should go into business support. You know, so there's a huge fight around that because fund managers will actually want to get the money, get the fees, and be able to, you know, um, uh, dispense of the money, you know, through different funding models and so forth. And then they make fees out of it. Secondly, they also do post-investment support. So as a result, they're actually crowding out small, you know, your business, um, you know, advisors. And some of them are even opening organizations that are providing, you know. So the biggest threat to business advisors is actually fund managers, right? I'm not gonna mention names, you, you know some of them. So, so that's the first issue. So the money that is there now gets challenged as to use it for. Two, companies are starting to say, I'm giving you 2%. My corporate, you know, your, my commercial teams are working their butt off to make the money. At the end, you get the, two, the, the, the 2%. So we normally say the commercial team breeds the money and the ESD team bleeds the money, right? That's the joke, you see, because we are seeing as people are just re reckless spending, right? Companies are starting to tighten up. CFOs are starting to get involved. Look, I'm giving you 150 million rand. What the hell are you doing? Right? So the, 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 the pressure is there to demonstrate. And every year we have to go back. In the past, we used to go and say the law says it should give me the money. Some companies now are prepared to scope low PE points than to, than to just throw money at it. You already can see it has started in ownership. So ownership deals now are not done really nearly like in the past. For people who do vendor financing. It's to, um, you know, the, 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 the ESD space. But it's even going into SED, which is uh, CSI, where people are looking for social impact, all right? Companies want their money, hard and made money, to be used to invest responsibly. Yeah. So that's why it becomes critical then, then from a business advisors that when you get these opportunities, you gotta be able to know that the people are getting the money, worked hard to get it, and to actually get funding for the next two, three, five years. They, you need to demonstrate that they are using the money responsibly and they are tough returns. So it's not about how many people you've trained. It's you've trained them, then what happened to them. So your impact, your, your impact analysis is getting far more greater. So the advisors can actually integrate that into what they do to say, is what I'm doing providing the right impact so that there is the investment keeps on coming when it, when it comes to ESD. Otherwise, you're going to get a situation where some of the some companies are going to close ESD. Some of you would know what's happening with Anglo, Zimele. Anglo has decided, you know what, we've been doing this for years, we're scaling down. And some of the reasons is because they're struggling to get impact. They put billions into it. I mean, they did this even before the codes were there. But the questions are the new leadership is coming and asking, we're putting this money, what are we getting in return? So those are the type of things that advisors need to be aware of. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, it's not necessarily only from the corporate, the big buyers of ESD uh, or not so. I mean, that's the big thing I learned from you the other day is that we should also be tuning into the shift in the marketplace in terms of the medium-sized businesses that are starting to launch ESD programs. Are they also looking at impact as a, as a, as a measure? Are they also bringing it closer to their core business? So do, the, do those medium-sized businesses still see this kind of like a tax that we need to pay so that we have the right scorecard to get government contracts? Yes, and if anything, these are the medium guys that have big contracts with corporates. So there's a whole supply chain value chain in there. And we even see the, if I can speak of a tier one versus a tier two supplier. So the suppliers of the suppliers that are now being developed to make sure that the core suppliers are actually supported by the right tier of suppliers around them. So it's, it's even at a level further than that. So that becomes suppliers with ED beneficiaries around them. So I think the world has become, for some of the practitioners, and I've even asked, answered some of the questions there, is that we kind of become so obsessive with providing a service to a corporate because we think that is where the money is. Yet when, when we start looking at, for example, the, the medium-sized engineering firms, for those where we know they have specialist skills and the generous skills um, around compliance and ESD related to their scorecards or where big transformation deals have just taken place. Those are the low hanging fruit that they actually have to go, go find. And I'm, I'm talking about the companies who we've recently engaged with like the Proconics of this world. We, we look at, for example, um, 
yeah, engineering with highly specialist skills or a, a, a legal firm. So those highly specialist skills who now still have to be compliant to the VE codes, they also have to spend their, their ESD and get as close as possible to their, um, to their spend. And they need the practitioners even more and, and they don't even know where to start looking. No, no so the, the, the questions that have been posted around um, if I look at um, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Lynn's question around uh, inconsistencies in the qualifications and ESD providers and practitioners, what is the professional qualification? Start to get a very important issue there so that there's some kind of a sense when you're a buyer that the people that you are buying are in fact capable of delivering what they're promising. And Ishran, I think also he asked about Ibasa specifically. So uh, uh, perhaps, uh, Lesejo, if I can bring you in here, you know, sort of in terms of Ibasa's understanding of standardization of the industry and uh, professionalization of business advising, uh, what, how do we ask, answer Irashan's um, uh, question about um, how well Ibasa is known in the industry and whether it could play a better role in terms of ensuring that the practitioners are recognized? Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm so excited. One of the things that IBASA is active in is starting the engagement with stakeholders on key issues that affect businesses and business advising. Um, Cheryl, just to answer you on that one, um, that's why IBASA is a professional body. Uh, we're recognized by the South African Qualifications Authority simply to professionalize business advising. And we are in the industry for 20 years now. And business advising, to be very honest, was not always taken as seriously as it should have been. I always say one of the reasons our developing country finds itself in the dilemmas that we sometimes find ourselves in is because business advising is not considered a profession. However, when you look at the need that leaded out, or even Anya stating that, you know what, it would be great to know what standards are there. We are saying as Ibasa, we put our hand up and we are engaging with all stakeholders, including corporate and those in the ESD, to talk about it. Um, we don't believe in just dictating to the market what the professionalization or even business standards for this should, should be. But what we're saying is that there's a need, a great need to make sure that charlatans and people who take people's money for granted are held accountable. And that's what we as IBASA do. We have a great code of conduct and we hold our members liable. Secondly, we want to make it clear that as IBASA, we are advocating that those in the ESD space, as well as practitioners, should consider accreditation. Um, we accredit business advisors across three levels, um, entry being business advisor, then principal business advisor, and the highest being certified business advisor. So in terms of where IBASA is standing, we are saying it's time for the industry to really consider that the money that they throw into ESD as well as the products that they want to see works with accreditation and not without it. I just wanted to raise a question to Lita. Of all the projects that they've been running, did they consider accreditation of those business advisors or was it just um, where they appointed based on what they saw? Because for us, we're saying, let the industry begin to speak about it. Let there be that necessary requirement so that the EDS space can finally be given the respect that it deserves because it's doing a very good job. It shouldn't just be a handout. It's actually a necessity for businesses to remain sustainable. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, so, Lita, there's a direct question. You know, so okay. what uh, corporates are starting to say, let's look at the professional bodies, accreditation of the service providers. Okay, as it is now, it, it's, it's not there. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Right, um, because remember, it's the, the the key thing is that the sector body itself is the one that must entrench its position. We know there's a challenge, right? But uh, if you look, for an example, in the procurement space, there's SIPs. If it's in procurement, register with SIPs. It's they've normalized it, so it becomes key then that um, from Ibasa things like doing, you know, mini conference, calling corporate companies, not your members, corporate companies, say, guys, this is what we do. This is how we do it. This is how we entrench our offering courses where their accreditation 
our members, if you use them, this is what you can expect. Because once there is an adoption, then as soon as the person walks in, the first question I'm going to ask, do you have any uh, bus accreditation? If no, in fact, I'll put it as part of the specification when you take an opportunity out uh, on a tender. If it so happens that you take a tender, or if it's a closed tender, then you are able to still put it as a requirement. Then you'll start to see how people trickle back into the organization. So there needs to be that level of collaboration. And also, I suppose, if you look at DTI and also the National Department of Small Business, that needs to incorporate because once there is an embracement from government, from corporate sector, and also from the, the private sector, then it becomes easy for, for, for IBA. So there are also other platforms where you can work with business units in South Africa and so forth, or business um, you know, leadership, SA, BLSA, where you get at the forefront. Embracement, you will get it in the sector, all right? As it is now, uh, people are using different accreditation bodies. So for example, I'll say I want a turnaround management association member for my for mine, but it's my decision. It's not in it's informed that maybe I've got an affinity for that body. All right. Someone else could choose totally a different organization that you must be SACA or you must go into SAPA and so forth. So if BASA will need to take a far more leadership and include the business um, association like BUSA and BLSA, make sure that DTI, because once you get your DTI and your you know, and, and your small business, it's easy then that the sector starts to embrace and make nose around poor service delivery that is provided by practitioners purely because they are not under inoculated sort of uh, gym. Yeah, so it starts with volunteering yourself as a BASA member uh, practitioners because uh, guess what, something is gonna happen soon. <laughs> Um, I just want to share the poll uh, results quickly. Um, in terms of, remember, we voted on what we reckon the most challenging uh, issues are for us to face um, in ESD. And there are three st that stand out. The one is that BDS providers do not understand ESD needs. The providers do not understand the ESD needs of the companies. So there's a challenge for us as practitioners. We better start educating ourselves about what the ESD buyers want. Uh, second, and, and that's what us, we're saying, okay? we, we reckon we don't know enough. A few BDS providers are dominating the market. So I think that's kind of, uh, both Anya and Dita spoke about that, you know, sort of the need for uh, the buyers to manage their risks too, and to be sure that they buy it from an institution that's going to be able to deliver, so they tend to maybe go for a bigger company. But isn't there perhaps a cue for us that we can be working with those bigger companies in delivering things that they can't? Um, and I really got that from you, Lita, today, that you were saying, uh, we need to specialize. We need to, we, need to, we need to be really expert in something. And therefore, we'll get the work to do that expert uh, intervention that's needed. And then the third one is focus on corporate compliance rather than on long-term economic development. I suppose that is kind of inherent in a points based system where you uh, need to make sure that you meet the outcomes, which is putting your points onto your scorecard while also wanting economic development. But that's interesting that, that from, our, from our people in the room today, we see those as the three most um, important uh, issues that we need to deal with as an industry. Um, may I uh, say that we are kind of fast running out of time. So um, there was one more, well, if, you, if you can persist a bit, a bit longer, let me just go over half the hour. Um, I wanted to come to Given's uh, point. Um, uh, I see Anya, you already uh, started uh, answering that. Uh, as smaller providers, you know, sort of, because a lot of us in the room here are smaller providers. We're one-person shows or three-person shows, and do we offer mentorships? A lot of us kind of general support. Uh, how do we position ourselves better to improve our business? You know, we, we, we need to grow our business. And if we compete against these big uh, providers, um, it's not so easy always for us to achieve the results that we want for our own business, you know, get the business... Uh, be busy and invoice for that. So I want to, uh, maybe as a last question, both of you, Lita and um, Anya, how can service providers that are small, maybe one person shows, position themselves better? If you have one or two tips for us, please. Anya, if you can go first. Okay, so I think one of the first things would be that even though if you're a one-man band, the bigger guys always need other guys. So part of your own go-to-market should be the whole networking approach because how would we even know about you if you are pitching directly to the other, to the ESD managers? So maybe it's a 
it's a good idea to really take this collaboration thing seriously. If it means starting up a LinkedIn group with all the practitioners where we can engage and post and um, where the needs are for, for these small guys then to pitch to the, yeah. to the more well-established brands, let's then cre create that community if possible. So there's no way there's no way we can stop social and how we collaborate electronically. So maybe let's be bold and start something as bold as that. Great stuff. And Lita, what would your, be your tips to a potential service provider, a small guy, one or two person band? Look, there is hope. Uh, as I speak to some of my colleagues, they are not actually impressed with the big guys as you think they are. Over time, they are going to start to lose business because they are running more like factories now. They are not attending to core things that needs to be done, right? Um, it's just that they, they tend to have good offices, bigger network, right? Because also you don't want to drive business advisors, you know, uh, where they, 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 they use them as sweatshops. So where if I hire a bigger company and they go find a, a person can do the work and they, and they bucket 30% uh, of that for doing absolutely nothing. So, so, so there's an issue there because you're just diluting the budgets that you have. So as I said, there's big hope. What is needed, this is where from Inibasa that things like using technology, build a platform, right? Where if I want to buy these services, I can do it there, I can build it, can do a scope, someone can scope the work that needs to be done. Then it gets flowing to smaller companies. That is, that, that is one way of doing it, right? So you, you're sort of democratizing um, small business development because I worry personally about the smaller guys are not getting work, who in fact are getting through the back doors because we use the big guys who outsource to them, right? So there is a space for smaller guys, you know, because some of the projects we do are not big projects, right? So the, the tip there is that Ibasa, one, make sure that we, let's build a platform I can get involved there to make sure that if I am looking for A, B, C, D, E, I know exactly where I can go. And also it could be a trading platform, basically similar to Alibaba, where I can go there and actually buy services. You know, as, and also I can put specification in terms of what I want. And then those specification can flow through into uh, putting teams who can actually, um, similar to how audit firms work where one you know, um, mandate comes from a corporate client, someone within the business will pick and pick people within the organization, put a team, a diverse team, to be able to deliver on that. That then starts to actually spread the money across the, um, you know, the smaller service providers. And out of that, because it's all about money flow, we need money from corporates to flow into smaller guys, give them the opportunity to pitch, give them the opportunity to work. And if we need to collaborate and call other uh, you know, uh, like-minded people in my sector, similar to, similar to what I do, I'm, I'm prepared to work with, with, with Ibasa to do that. Because it's, impo it's important from a job creation to make sure we build bigger, stronger service provision. Because as we increase our procurement into Black-owned businesses, the demand becomes bigger. Yeah. Right? It's just that now, if you use three or four companies who are checking same thing, they're preaching the same thing in different companies and they are actually now closing the market and going and outsourcing to smaller guys. It's not really being helpful because they can control who gets the work, who doesn't get the work. Whereas in this instance, the corporate company still holds the ability to do that. It's just that there needs to be a model of project management because I don't want to manage five uh, service providers. I want to work with one, two or three or four you know, teams who are made of different um, sort of business advisors. By doing that, then the work would be able to flow in a very fair manner. And also those that are performing will survive in that sector. And, and, and personally, that is how I think that's the most optimal way of actually doing it. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, so as we professionalize, we also need to build viable businesses so that we can actually be professionals. Uh, professionals get paid professional fees. So the notion of a mentor as being someone that, that kind of uh, provides their free service on the side is something that's been in the past, but it's the past. So I must say, uh, this has been a really kind of stimulating discussion. And I see here in the chat so many good points being raised. I mean, Daphne is saying uh, all the good points are being raised in the presentations and um, the mapping out of the B, roles of the BA as the, cha the people that must drive the change. You know, sort of, so it is our job also then to make sure that that change that we want to see is uh, realized in the industry. Uh, ideas about LinkedIn groups and so on, all things to pick up from. Um,
But uh, we will be back uh, next month with the webinar. So, by the way, uh, let me just warn you, uh, Lita, uh, Anya, Lisehua, and also Carl, if you can come into the room um, as a as a wrap up, if we can just take one uh, takeaway that you have, an important takeaway that you have from our discussion here today. So, Carl, maybe if you want to come into the room as well, you can sit in the back all the time. Um, and uh, but before we do that, uh, we're gonna we're gonna run a webinar next month, uh, focusing on how we can support our Clients, uh, when they experience cash flow crunch during the summer holiday period, as many do. For some, it's a it's a it's a big kind of uh, business boom um, in summer, but uh, for many, it is uh, January and December are really slow months. So, as business advisors, how can we support our clients in planning for that cash flow crunch that they're anticipating to happen over the summer holidays? And that's the topic of our November webinar. Uh, we have. In our community, experts in this field and people that are giving advice to clients all the time. So what we're asking is if you are interested to come in as a panelist, if you can send an email to uh, webinar at the hyphen epi.org and just stipulate there the one, two or three tips that you would give a client uh, around this topic. And then uh, guess what? You may end up being a panelist uh, in our next webinar. So um, I'll just type it in there. It's, it's webinar at the hyphen epi.org um, in the chat that uh, email address is there now so send the email and just give us the one or two or three tips that you would give your clients in terms of cash flow management during the summer holiday period so we're back in the room here now to end up our discussion around the topic and then we'll go over to um, ibasa internal stuff um, so don't uh, run away ibasa members or those that are interested in becoming ibasa members uh, we will keep talking about uh, all the organizational issues and updates to just now. But before we do so, in terms of our topic of today, um, Carl, if I can start with you, and then we'll work it around the room. Um, Lesejo, Anya, and, and Rita, I'll come to you too. Uh, what is your takeaway from our discussion here today? Carl, if you can start. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Christoph. I think uh, yeah, absolutely great webinar, great information from deep experience and wide experience. For me, definitely, it's in our hands. So as individual business advisors, small business owners, um, we through the professional body of IBASA need to collaborate and, and create uh, offerings that uh, can contribute value into this uh, supply chain. Um, so that's in our hands. Great. Thanks, uh, Carl. And Lesejo, what is your takeaway from the discussion? I'm trying to unmute you, but unsuccessfully so. Maybe you can do that. <laughs> Yay, the beauty of technology. Um, on my side, um, two things. Uh, Ibas has been active in definitely advocating for the professionalization of the sector. So, Lita, rest assured, we will definitely be taking up on your offer. I know Christoph and myself, we're excited about conferences, not because it's a talk shop, but because it's one of the most effective ways to get across a message in a very short period of time. So, definitely, we will be taking you up on that. Um, as a senior manager here at Ibasa, we can only commit to our members as well as to the public that we're serious about the mandate to professionalize the sector. And we don't just want to talk about it. Uh, we want our actions to speak. So thank you so much. Every month, make an appointment with us. Lots of things to discuss in the industry, and we want you to be a part of it. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, uh, Ms. Echo. Um, and Anya, what is your takeaway? I, I always sit back and I listen to both sides and whichever side it comes from. But at the end of the day, if we keep our ball on the entrepreneur, which is it. So we have so many people to please and so many things to get happy. But as, as, as practitioners, our role is to develop entrepreneurs, and that should be our main focus. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Lita, I'm kind of setting you up to say something profound now. <laughs> if you um, may. Well, three things from my side. Firstly, it, uh, I mean, I was looking also at people's comments. We need to, to, to democratize EST, to open it up, because I think the ideas that could flow and the solutions are right with us as, as a sector. Secondly, we've got to collaborate more, share more information. All right, what I'm hearing here should not be foreign. We should be able to share it freely, position each other. There is also a, a point where we need to also understand how we are being viewed by the, pro by the providers. 
because in this instance, I was pushing the message out, but also I need to understand how we are viewed because there are some elements that we as corporate sector ourselves needs to change. Thirdly, it's the important role of IBASA because just by having now, this is the role that it needs to be that we need to do far more and bigger at scale so that we get the message out because once we do that, we're able to affect the, the sector far more greater than, than what we're doing now. But when it's all said and done, as Anya has said, there are entrepreneurs that needs to be helped out there and there are jobs that needs to be you know, created uh, if all of us know what's happening in the country. And those are the two things that are going to get us out of the economic change that we currently have. Yeah. No, great stuff. Yeah, there's a challenge to us is we've got a big contribution to make uh, in supporting our businesses, our clients to grow. So that's 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 the only way for us, and it's a big job. So thank you very much, Lita and Anya, for your really insightful contributions here today. I hope the discussion will keep going. Uh, we're back next month with a different topic. And remember, uh, if our some members that want to come in as uh, panelists uh, to send the email to webinar at the iPhoneEPR.org uh, with the tips that you would give for someone that's sitting with a cash flow crunch during the summer holiday period. And um, then you may end up being a panelist as well next month. Um, but before everyone runs away, uh, we still have some time uh, uh, for us to talk about the Ibasa. Um, communication issues and updates and, and so on. Opportunity for Ibasa members to also engage with Secretariat through the CEHO. Uh, so Alita and Anya, you are most welcome to stay on. In fact, it may be interesting for you to know a bit more about the discussions happening inside Ibasa. But if you need to run off to appease your board, I know Anya, you just came out of a board meeting and um, or something else, then it's, it's, it's okay. Um, so, um, Lesejo, if I may hand over to you, uh, you know, sort of what is up at Ibasa and what can members look forward to in the coming period? Yes, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, definitely exciting times. Um, we were part of the SMME colloquium happening at Galaga from the 25th to the 26th. Once again, advocating for the professionalization of business advising. So, as an Ibasa member, you can rest assured that on every platform that we can find, we are advocating for this profession to be taken in the serious manner that it is. Secondly, um, please look out for communication that we've been sending via our emails, um, so uh, by our newsletters, so that you would know what's happening as well in the organization. Uh, we've recently launched the Western Cape region. So if you're in the Western Cape, drop us an email. Then we will assist in letting you know who is in your area. Secondly, what, and most importantly, do make sure that you also check out the website to see the blogs that we do post on important um, uh, webinar topics, as well as information that we do have. The most important thing that we can inform our members is that we recently engaged with the service theater and we are engaging on a higher education, having OS codes to also align to business advising. So when it comes to people who deal with SDFs or work skills plan, our plan is that even business advising can be found on the of codes that impact all sectors that are careers or even jobs. So this industry is growing. We are part of the change. Thank you, Chris. Great uh, stuff. Thanks for that. So uh, Ibasa email address, you mentioned if people are interested, they need to send that. Which address then they do they need to send it to? Yes, and just to notify those who want to be panelists, uh, the deadline is the 29th of October. I see my colleague accidentally put the 26th of October, so it's not today, um, it's the 29th of October. Do join us. We're interested in what you as members have to say and the advice. As indicated, we are interested in members collaborating and sharing. It's the only way to keep growing. Uh, so, so what is the email address that people should use? They should use admin at ibasa.org.za. Great stuff, and that's in the chat, in the chat area there. So. If you want to become a member, you can send an email there. If you have some other issues to take up with the Secretariat, you can do that there too. And otherwise, you know, sort of we will look forward to our webinar next month. So thank you very much, Definitely. everyone. Thank you for joining There's us. We're over 50 people in the room, so it seems like we had, a, in fact, we were over 70. I think we were 72 or something at one point in time. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us here today and seeing. looking forward to seeing you next next time around. Bye -bye. Definitely. Thank you.